So we'll go ahead and get started. I'll leave the poll questions up. Um, but good evening and welcome and a happy Earth Month. My name is Cameron Reed. I am the Environmental Program Specialist for the City of Shoreline. And we are so glad you're here for our second class in our Earth Day Every Day series, um, where we're talking about ways we can each protect the Earth, fight climate change, and live more sustainably uh, in our daily lives. So I'm, I'm really excited for tonight's class. We have Laura Motter from the Garden Hotline here to talk about how to compost food scraps at home using a couple of different compost systems. Some you might've heard about, uh, some maybe a little newer. Um, and, but before we, before we dive into that, I just have a couple of housekeeping things and some announcements. Um, so, First thing is that we do have these poll questions up. So if you haven't uh, submitted your answers, feel free to do that. Just that it's just an icebreaker. It helps us get a sense of who's here with us tonight. Um, and the main question is, what do you do with your food scraps? Do you have a backyard bin? Do you use a worm bin? Do you have curbside compost service? If you're a shoreline resident in a house here, um, do you put them in the trash? So what do you do with your food scraps? And this is a Zoom webinar, so we can't see or hear you, but we're very glad you're here. Um, so we ask that you please use the chat if you have need assistance or um, you know pr to provide comments and we'll see if we can help you. But if you have a question for our presenter, please use the Q&A button. So both the chat and the Q&A should be either at the top or the bottom of your screen in Zoom. And, um, the Q&A feature just allows us all to see the question. And then if somebody else has asked your same question, you can, there's a little thumbs up button, you can like it uh, and it should let you, um, that'll bump it up to the top of our list. So we'll do our best to help you. We got a lot of people logged on tonight. Um, so we may not get to all the questions, but um, just we appreciate you asking them. And uh, the webinar is being recorded. So if you have to step away or miss part of it, um, I will send out that recording to everyone who attended, to the email address you provided. It'll also be online at our shorelinewa.gov slash Earth Day um, page, and it'll be on YouTube. So lots of ways to watch it. So no worries, don't feel like you have to feverishly scribble notes. Um, we will go to uh, till about eight o'clock tonight and then stop and take uh, questions. So we'll, we'll leave a good chunk of time at the end for questions, uh, and we will be wrapped up by 8.30 at the very latest, I promise. Um, already whenever, please use the Q&A feature for questions. Um, love it. See some people already throwing stuff in there. That is excellent. And just checking to see if we have anybody on the phone. We do have somebody on the phone. So um, if you would like to ask a question on the phone during, during the Q&A, you can press uh, star nine and that will raise your hand. It'll alert me that you have a question and then I will uh, unmute you and you can press star six to unmute yourself. Um, once at that time. So uh, also, if you haven't heard, we are running a photo challenge this month as part of our Earth Day celebrations, Earth Month celebrations. So we can't all be together uh, and, and celebrate um, the many great ways that we you know, try to protect our planet. Uh, we can't do that in person. So we're doing little photo challenges each week during the month of April. So our first one is up on the website and it was about uh, reducing waste so things that prevent waste. This mission is about, surprise, composting food scraps. So how do you compost your food scraps? Send us a picture of either your food scrap collection system or your what you use to actually do the compost uh, if you do it yourself. Uh, you can submit it. it. It's basically just send it to my email, um, which you can find at the website down there, or I think I've been emailing you a bunch if you signed up for the classes. So um, send me your photo by next Monday uh, to enter a raffle, we have a couple great prizes. Um, we have these uh, Abigo beeswax food wraps, um, which are great. It's an alternative to plastic clean wrap. And that's actually kind of preserves your food even better. Um, and then we have some awesome 100% recycled content shopping bags, reusable shopping bags. And I have some of those uh, sustainable shoreline coffee thermoses as well as a few other things. So into the raffle, just send us a photo and the information is there on that website. Email photos to me, there's my email address. So before we jump in, just a little bit about why we're doing this. So why compost your food scraps? And composting 
uh, as you might know, it's an amazing natural technology that has just a ton of different environmental benefits. One of which is restoring soil life, fertility and nutrition. So, um, you know, when we spread compost, when we mix it into our soil, um, it just, it has these ex exploding cascading benefits for our plants and for the whole ecosystem um, that kind of starts from the ground up. And a lot of times in an urban environment like uh, Seattle or Shoreline during development, they really just scraped a bunch of the nice fluffy topsoil that had a ton of organic matter in it. They scraped it, you know, when they were building and then they put down a lawn or something. So there's really only a couple inches of, of good soil. So here we can see a photo of a rain garden installation in Shoreline. And you can see, you can tell from the dark rich soil on top, it's, it was actually mulched with compost, but they also mixed in a bunch of compost under the rocks there into the, the soil. And that's also helping soak up our rainwater runoff. So it prevents pollution um, in our lakes, streams and Puget Sound. You know, that helps protect our salmon and orca. The plants look lovely. They're gonna be super happy in all that compost. Um, and also a cool note, using compost actually can build up the carbon uh, stored in the soil and can help, help sequester carbon, uh, take it out of the atmosphere. So, um, you know, especially when that's done at scale across an urban landscape, across farmland, this can, that can really add up and actually make a difference for climate change. So there's some cool science coming out about that. Another awesome thing about composting. Uh, so in King County and in the city of Shoreline, we have a goal to reach zero, zero waste of resources by 2030. Um, but currently we're pretty far from that. In the 2019 study, they found that 70% of what King County residents sent to the landfill um, in 2019 could have been recycled or composted. And 45% of that in the 2019 study was organics. So part of it was clean wood, but a good chunk of it was food and food soil paper. Um, so, you know, composting is just a key strategy. If we wanna reach zero, zero waste, um, if we wanna extend the life of our landfill and make sure those good resources are getting, um, you know, being used in a good way, being recycled into, into our lawns and gardens and farms, uh, composting is a great way to do that. And doing it at home is even better. But I can't talk about composting without talking about the food that goes into it. So um, this stat is just really mind boggling, but 40% of the food that is uh, sold and produced in America is wasted. So it's not even consumed. Um, and that is to the tune of about, the average is like $1,400 uh, a year for a, for a family of four. So there's just a huge environmental, social, financial impacts. Um, all the resources you know, that go into producing that food are wasted along with it. So while we wanna compost everything we can, we wanna start by eating as much as we can and storing it properly and, and buying smart in the first place. So I love this little diagram down here from, uh, this is a group down in the Bay Area of California, but it starts in the upper left with planning. So buy what you need, store it properly, eat everything you can, and then compost is at the end of it. So um, without further ado, I will turn it over to Laura. And uh, yeah, just really excited to have her. She's the Natural Yard Care Program Director at um, the Garden Hotline, which is a free resource for King County residents. You can call them. We'll show you the number at the end of the presentation. You can call them during their business hours and with just about any gardening question, they can help you out. And uh, so Laura, yeah, we're excited to do a deep dive into food scraps composting systems. Take it away. Great. There we go. All right, does everybody see the screen okay, I hope? Cameron, looking good on your end? That looks good to me, yeah, thanks. Great, so we're gonna um, talk about composting at home, focusing primarily on food scrap composting. Um, we'll show a little bit about yard waste systems, uh, but won't belabor that, but if you want to know more about it, as Cameron said, you can call the Garden Hotline and ask us more. Uh, Tell Alliance has been uh, composting started as an organization um, interested in health of soil and compost is a big part of that. 
And so we've been championing and teaching people about how to do any kind of composting uh, for many years now. Um, so we can help you out with troubleshooting systems or picking a new system, anything like that. So um, when you wanna choose this type of system you want for your home, you have to think about what kind of time you have to manage it. Um, are you looking for yard waste or food waste system or both? Uh, and they are different and rarely combined um, unless you're living way out in the country where it doesn't matter if the rats are getting into your compost bins. Um, you wanna think about the types of composting structures that might work in your garden or in your home. Sometimes these, uh, some of these food waste systems can actually be in your home. Um, and then, you know, the space that you use them in, uh, how does that fit into your garden? Uh, do, do you have space for a three bin system if you're doing yard waste? or a wooden worm bin, what, what are your choices there? So um, I did share some links with Cameron, which he will share with you, which have uh, links to different bins you can create, make yourself. Um, also how to choose a compost bin for your, for your use uh, through King County uh, brochure that's um, pretty useful. And then um, so a composting at home brochure from the city of Seattle, which goes into, again, the different types of composting and a little more deep dive uh, to learn more about it. So looking at yard waste systems, typically yard waste systems are structures that um, usually are multiple bins so that you can start with an input bin, you fill that up and then you turn it into the bin next to it. Uh, and that's part of the composting process. So turning it helps to um, invigorate it again and to get it uh, hot again so that the decomposition will happen. These take up a lot of room and um, take a lot of time management. There is a simple sort of one bin system where you just add materials to it and let it sit. We call that more of a cold pile versus the hot piles that you create in the, bins, the, the multiple bin systems. Um, and that would take longer to break down, but these are things you would use to put your leaves in or yard waste um, that's appropriate for these type of bins. We don't mix food waste into this. The Seattle composter is a piece of plastic that's a big flat sheet that you curve around to make a tube and you have a lid on the top and bottom. And these are also great for that one pile system, or you can turn them by removing the lid and taking the materials out and then putting it back in again periodically. You can kind of flip them over, so to speak. You would lay a tarp out and put the materials on it and then um, put the materials back in the bin. But these guys are also great for storing things. So if you have a lot of extra leaves in the yard in the fall, these are great for storing those. They break down into a nice leaf mulch that makes a good mulch to put into your garden over the growing season. So it's, it's also a good way to uh, stockpile materials. So talking about food waste systems, there's a variety of different ways that we compost food waste. Um, we can use food, what we call a food digester, which is a more passive system. And it's a little bit more anaerobic, uh, sits it, um, partially buried in the ground and the food um, decomposes in the soil um, area. It's a, you know, within the bin and you have microorganisms that come in from the soil into this to help decompose. And it leaches out into the, um, surrounding area and or you harvest it. And a worm bin is actually a live, you know, home for worms that we create with bedding and food waste. Uh, and then they break all of the material inside of that down. And that makes a very nice compost. Um, Bokashi systems, and I noticed somebody uh, made a comment, I think either in the chat or Q and A that they use Bokashi. This is also, um, a food waste decomposition system that uses a bucket inside your home or in your basement or garage or wherever you choose to store it, but also uses enzymes and um, special microorganisms that are sprinkled into the waste and then layered with paper waste um, to be able to get something to break down, but then you have to bury it. Um, so burying food waste is kind of the last um, and most probably primitive method of doing composting, but it works quite well. The only difference or the only caveat here is for both Bokashi and burying food waste, you have to have a place to bury it. So you have to have some unused space. 
So let's look at a little more closely what a green cone looks like. So in the picture on the right, you see the basket on the bottom. This is the part that's buried into the ground. And underneath that green sleeve is a black cone that attaches to the base. And then the green cone sits over it um, for in, um, stability and to make it more attractive and to put a lid on it. Um, the part that's buried under the ground is vulnerable at times to rats. So this is something um, that you can actually put hardware cloth around if you wanna protect the plastic um, and then bury it and um, do the system. So what you're gonna see is what you see in the left here in the photo with the flowers. Um, you have a, this cone that sticks up out of the ground and you open the lid and you throw your food in it. These can be ordered through the um, conservation core at Magnuson Park um, and the green cone and the Seattle composter, which is that round bin, both are sold there. The homemade food digester is the exact same principle except for you just buy a galvanized metal can and you drill out holes on the bottom and on the sides and then you bury that in the ground and put the lid on to keep raccoons and other critters out. You'd put a bungee cord across the top tied into the handles on the bin. And basically you just, again, open the lid and throw your food in here. Um, worm bin options are varied and many. You can make worm bins out of many things. I've seen metal worm bins and other types of plastic. Sometimes people use barrels, um, just make a big worm bin out of that. But basically the premise is that you're creating habitat for worms to live in. Um, the two Tilt Alliance worm bin and the off the shelf bin we have plans for and, and Cameron also got the links for that. The worm factory is a, a manufactured product uh, that you can buy through stores and online. And um, the worms migrate up through the system and you put different layers on as you go. And then you have finished compost in the bottom pieces as the worms migrate up. So Bokashi food waste systems. Um, this is basically the fermentation in a bucket. This is showing what the system looks like. You have the um, enzymes that you sprinkle in on the food waste layer that you put in. Then you can add shredded paper layer. That helps keep fruit flies down. It also helps uh, with decomposition. You're adding a little carbon to that high ratio of nitrogen in the food waste. And then um, you can include all kinds of food in this. You can put meat and dairy and oily foods into here. Once the bucket is full, you let it sit for two weeks, you sealed, uh, you want it to cook in there essentially, and it becomes a bit slimy and messy, but then you bury it in the garden um, and you can wait a couple of weeks and then plant right directly in there. So you're kickstarting a lot of the microorganisms in the soil by adding this kind of um, fermented uh, compost directly into the garden. Um, and it's, it's a really favored way to do this by some people, um, particularly because you can include, you know, your table scraps and things like that in there. And then there's just the, the plain old berry in the ground. You want to make a deep enough hole so that your animals in the yard aren't digging it right back up again. So you have to have good diggable soil. Um, and then you bury it and cover it over again. And this just decomposes underneath everything and adds to the soil. Sometimes this is practiced in pea patches where people are just trimming off maybe bad leaves on their plants. You know, you have a cabbage plant that has some yellowing leaves and you just dig a hole and bury that, those leaves right back into the garden. Um, we also use those um, kinds of scraps in a, in a method called chop and drop in a garden like that, where you just layer them around plants and make a mulch by chopping them up directly. But basically you're not, you're not removing things from the garden, you're just leaving them right there. So the, this can work too for garden waste directly from a vegetable garden. Um, and the principles of food digesters and Bokashi are based basically on this method of burying your food waste. They're just done in a more um, modernized version so that things can go faster, um, that you don't have maybe as much labor involved and it's much easier to do. And then there are the barrel type composters. And this is the only kind of composter that um, at Tilt that we recommend people mixing food waste and yard waste in an urban system because they, we have so many rodents and so many critters that like to get into this stuff. 
So if you have a metal barrel composter, the plastic ones can be vulnerable. Rats can chew through plastic quite easily. Um, you can use these metal ones pretty well. They only produce a small volume of compost per batch, but it goes pretty quickly. Uh, so it can be a really useful tool. Sometimes people will mix and match and have different versions of all of these in their garden. I want to point out that kids really love compost. They love to dig in the compost bin. They love to play with it. They love the worms in the worm bin. So getting them involved in this process is a really good educational tool. Um, they will help you do this. They will be in enthused to take the kitchen scraps out and dig a hole and bury it for the worms or to investigate, you know, if there's worm babies or worm eggs in the, in the bin. Uh, so I would encourage you to get your kids or your grandkids or your neighbor kids or whoever you feel comfortable having in your garden um, to participate with you because uh, it will help you stay involved with it as well. Um, again, this, this is a thing that we manage and that we have to have time to do. So when you're thinking about what works for you, um, are there people that will help you with this process to make it a family project? So I want to talk about the essentials of composting. And this is basically true for whether it's yard waste or food waste. Um, we typically don't combine, as I said, in, the, in an urban area, rodents are very attracted to food waste. Um, they can easily gain access to them in an open style bin. So if you're adding food into a yard waste three bin system, you're asking for rodents to come and help uh, harvest from there and raccoons and squirrels and other critters, crows. Uh, crows can pick it apart. We want to think about compost as habitat for macro and microorganisms, which do the decomposition for you. This is essentially what we're seeing when we are planting plants into healthy soil, is that the plants are being fed by the action of the, mic uh, the microorganisms that are in the soil. Um, these guys are um, they are de decomposers that help to provide nutrients that then become available to plants. So compost is just organic matter. It's just like in any natural system, if you have leaves falling on the ground, they're gonna decompose microorganisms, macroorganisms, worms, other critters are gonna help break all that down. And then that's gonna become available to plants. So we are creating a habitat to keep them happy um, in the process, you will see those critters in your bins and systems. So um, be aware that this is, even in a food waste uh, digester, you're going to see the critters and um, other kinds of microorganisms in there. When you are adding pieces to any kind of compost system, the smaller the piece, the better, because it exposes more surface area to the microorganisms and it will decompose more quickly. So chopping things up is important, even in a food waste system, even when you're feeding your worms. All systems need a feedstock. And usually this is a combination of materials that are rich in carbon with materials rich in nitrogen, and they all need air and water in them as well. This is an example of some kinds of composting tools you might think you need. Um, a tarp to harvest your compost onto, uh, a tarp to cover a bin maybe to protect it, machetes to chop up a chopping surface. Um, you can use kitchen shears if you're just strictly doing food waste from the garden directly into the, into the worm bin. You just need a good pair of kitchen shears to chop up some of your food waste. Um, you want to take it out fairly fresh. Um, this is not the kind of case where you necessarily would store it up for too long, um, but take it out fresh, chop it up, and put it out in the garden, in the uh, bed, uh, worm bin bed. So pitchforks can help when you're turning things or trying to harvest from a bin. Hand trowels and claws can help too where you're moving things around, especially in a worm bin. Um, you want to keep the environment moist, so sometimes you need to water and add water to a system. Uh, typically a food digester, you won't need to do that too because it's pretty wet all by itself. And then having something to collect your kitchen scraps in. And I know that part of this class involves you guys getting to sign up to get a kitchen counter bin. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that and ways you can collect your food. 
And then buckets are useful to put your harvested compost into, or if you're doing Bokashi systems. So all of these tools are the kinds of things that you're gonna to wanna to have around. So we're gonna talk about what you add to a food waste compost system. When you're food, doing food at home or food composting at home, um, any of your fresh kitchen or vegetable garden scraps are fair game. So you can see probably a lot of useful produce in that bucket that she's dumping. You want your food to be used first, of course, but aren't and foremost, um, and not wasted. But if it's becoming, if you got some wilted lettuce, or if you have the outer leaves of the lettuce that you're taking off, or um, stems off of something that you're not going to cook, uh, then you can put all that banana peels eggshells. Um, again, crushing them makes smaller surfaces, but you can leave eggshells whole too sometimes because those make great places for worms to nest in. Coffee grounds are really wonderful for compost, especially for worm bins. Um, the worms really love it. And even that paper um, filter can go in. You just want to tear it up a bit. You can cut that up. So there's an example of worms of nesting up into eggshells. They will lay eggs up in uh, surfaces like this. They kind of create their little habitat in there. They can do that in banana peels. They might do it in an orange peel as well. So you can put bigger pieces in there too, knowing that you're creating spaces for them to do this, as well as chop things up that will decompose more quickly. You can also store food waste. If you have too much in a week's time, you can put some of it in the freezer um, and then put that out. It's better if it's really fresh, if it's going into directly into a worm bin. But if you have a food digester and you want to slow down how often you're putting things in there, you really only want to fill the food digester up to the level of the soil um, that that basket is buried in. And then you can add paper to absorb the moisture that you're going to get from things that are frozen. They will thaw out and be a little more liquefied. So you can add a little bit of carbon material to help deal with that. But this is a great way also to, um, <clears throat> even if you're using a curbside bin, to store food scraps so that you can take them out um, and not have a lot of fruit flies on your, fruit on your kitchen counter. These are the kinds of foods we don't want you to add to most food waste systems except for the Bokashi system. These products don't break down very well, or very easily. They cause a lot of um, rodent issues. Um, they could have bacterial issues. Cooking oil is just too messy. It's not gonna, it's gonna inhibit um, some of the decomposition that happens. So these things we encourage you to not put in there, but to put into the curbside system instead. So here's an example of food digester buried in a garden. These are really easy to use. Essentially, we're used to throwing things out. So you just lift the lid and you throw something in there just like tossing it in the garbage, except that you're putting something in that's going to decompose and then feed the ground around it and or you can harvest the compost back out of it. Um, they're a little harder to harvest out of than some other kinds of systems like a worm bin, <clears throat> but you can still do it. It's a little wetter. Um, and often it's just dug directly into the garden when you use it, when you, when you harvest it, you use it fairly quickly. The units are pretty simple to install. You just screw together the parts, the, the black cone to the black basket and slip the green cone over it and um, screw on the lid and it's ready to go, buried in the ground. The uh, galvanized one, you can see a cross-section here of what it looks like underground. So you're just burying the portion that you drill the holes out of. It's got holes in the bottom and about a third of the way up the side and you bury that and then you can see the bungee cord over the top <clears throat> showing you how to attach it so um, critters don't get into that. The finished compost isn't quite as nice as worm castings. Worm castings we call the Cadillac of compost because it makes a really dry, um, beautiful, crumbly compost. Um, but it's still very useful and you can, if, if you have multiple systems or multiple green cones and or you don't have a lot of food waste that you want to add to this, you can just fill this up and let it feed the ground around it. A lot of people use this in orchard areas. I've seen them in vegetable gardens and it's a way to feed your plants 
um, more passively and, add, and get your food scraps digested at the same time. So a worm bin um, can be a beautiful structure. I've seen people build benches like the one you see here that lid lifts up and you work with the bins. Some of them have arms that come down at the sides so that you don't damage the arms when you're working in the bin and uh, harvesting from it. Um, I've seen them with high backs on them with um, trellises so you can grow vines up them. A lot of creative solutions people have used to add worm bins to their garden. Um, they're very easy to use when you open the lid and you have your bedding in there, you just dig a hole and bury the food waste and um, the worms will migrate to it and do their work. So it's very quick to add food to them. Uh, there are some simple ways to harvest, which we'll look at. And then the manufactured worm factory style bins, those guys can be used indoors. Um, it's a woman who works with the city of Federal Way who actually keeps them, keeps one of those in her office. And it's just on a shelf in her office and nobody notices because when worm bins are, um, man are um, managed properly, you don't have a, a lot of smell to them. Uh, they're, it's just sort of an earthy smell. So she adds her food waste to it and adds her trays and she you know, has, has a working worm bin right in her office. She can do this under a kitchen sink. You could do it in the basement of your house and they work really well. Um, one of the issues with worm bins is that you actually need to have them built or build them yourself um, unless you're buying a manufactured product. Uh, you typically need to rodent proof them, especially plastic and wood products, but you can use hardware cloth like you see in the bottom picture and you can wrap that around the outside of the bin um, and just tack it on and that will help to keep the rodents out of there. Um, you need to weatherproof them when they're outside. Uh, this is the general formula for feeding a worm bin. It's a pound of food waste for one square foot in one week. And the tilth bin is an eight square foot bin. So you can put eight pounds of food waste into it weekly. Um, it's what we call the golden rule of worm bins. So that's basically the ratio that you're looking to feed these so that you don't overwhelm the worms with too much food and or not feed them enough so that they starve. These are examples of bedding materials. This is basically the carbon material that you're putting into the bin that creates the habitat that the worms live in. They will decompose all of this as well. You um, add the food into the layers of these materials in your bin. You, had, um, you have to have moisture. Um, worms will dry out if the bedding is too dry. So you add the bedding and you water it well. When you feel the bedding, it should feel like a wrung out sponge. So you can tell what that feels like in your hand. And you wanna to continue to check moisture levels, levels periodically. If you have any kind of hole where moisture is getting in from the rain, it could get too wet. Um, if you're putting a lot of really wet foods in there, that can change the moisture level. So just keep it, keep checking on it and you can add bedding as you need um, <clears throat> to as well during the process of um, the worms decomposing everything. You want to make sure that the bedding doesn't get compacted in the bin, which it will over time. As they start to work uh, and decompose everything, you start to get more and more um, worm castings and, and compost in there. You can add fresh bedding periodically, but at some point um, you do need to harvest it. But one thing you can do to keep it from getting too compact is just to shred up a bunch more paper and and um, add it to the top of the bin. And then you need to protect it from temperature variations. So you don't want it to get too hot or too cold. You want the worm bin insulated when it's outside in the winter. Um, burlap, bubble wrap around the bin can help. If it's a plastic bin, it's gonna be less insulated than a wood worm bin would be. Uh, you can also in a wood bin, just add cardboard layers or burlap to the inside of the bin on top of the bedding and that helps to provide some insulation. Or you can add just a bunch of extra shredded bedding on the top in the winter as well. In the summertime, you know, making sure that it's a spot that's not gonna be in the full hot sun all day long, but gets some shade, especially in the hot part of the afternoon is ideal um, because you don't wanna cook them. They are live beings. You're trying to keep them uh, healthy and alive inside. Um, all of these <clears throat> types of bins can create liquids that come off the bin. 
Uh, so typically you're raising these up off the ground, but you can see in this picture, um, they actually have a way to be able to release the um, tea, they call it worm tea, and you can dilute that down and use it to um, pour around plants as a mild uh, fertilizer. This is the type of worm that we see in a worm bin. It's a red worm, Mycenia. And these guys um, are not soil worms, so they're not an earthworm. They are a worm that you see in the soil and the surface of a forest, which has a lot of leaves in it. So their habitat is organic, not mineral, which is why our worm bins are filled with things like shredded paper and leaves and, and things that they are familiar, would be more familiar with, something that would be, um, seem like the forest floor. They are um, plentiful when they are happy um, and you can tell when they're not happy as well because they will try and climb out of the bin um, if it's too wet, if it's too full of food, if it's too hot, too cold, you'll see them climbing up the sides of the bin. If you're looking for sources of worms to get your worm bin started, um, you can give the hotline a call. We can help you find a source nearer to you. Um, but places like Sky Nursery um, have sold them. I'm not sure um, if they're still available right now during COVID times. I'm not clear on who has them currently. Stoneway Hardware has had them. At times we have them right now. We don't have a high enough um, popula population to sell any or give any to anybody. Uh, but we can help you find those if you give us a call. Um, to prep the worm bin, getting it started for the first time, you add your bedding, that cellulose carbon rich material, you moisten it to a wrung out sponge, fill it up all the way, and then you're going to add your worms. Um, plus, you can add a little soil in there as well. We typically don't do that very often um, because they're not a soil dwelling insect, but um, you're, when you buy worms, you typically they are in some kind of material, so just add that material in with them. It's usually more worm castings than it is soil. You're going to bury the food scraps under the bedding right away so that they have some food. And, and again, remember that eight pounds per week in an eight uh, square foot space, but one pound per square foot. Um, accommodating drainage, remember to put them on something to elevate them, whether that's pavers or bricks, uh, something to keep them off the ground. And this type of wood bin, you don't have to worry about trying to collect the material. If you put it in a garden bed area, um, it will actually just drip off into the soil and help feed the soil around it. There is a lot of um, energy flow in a worm bin, in a compost pile, based on all of these microorganisms. And this is just a little sort of glimpse at what happens in the soil web, food web. Um, so this is a, what we call a composting food chain where all these things, things eat each other, things benefit each other, things work together. Um, so there, you could see any of these kinds of things in a bin and we want you to be aware of that because a lot of times people go, oh, there's mold in my bin. Well, that's not a bad thing. And you're definitely going to see that in a food digester. So don't worry about that. Um, very commonly seen, um, you might see slugs in there too. Become familiar with what slug eggs look like so you can remove them. Um, because when you spread your compost, if you have slug eggs in it, you're adding uh, slugs to the garden. Um, but a lot of these things aren't going to be a problem for your plants. They are just eating each other and eating uh, the organic matter that we put into the systems. Here's an example of what some of those things might look like. You see kind of the, the different molds and the fungal spores on these little um, guys up in the top. This is on leaf mold. Um, and these are yard waste systems that we're looking at, but this will, you can find this inside um, of a worm bin as well. When you're taking care of your worms, you don't want to overly disturb them. So you want to let them sort of live their life. Um, you want to check that moisture level frequently. You want to add carbon as you need to, and you want to remember not to put animal food waste in. Disturbing the worms, really, they're creating a habitat in there. If you start to dig for them, you'll notice they'll do a deep dive. They will move away from you. Um, so 
they don't like to be out in the light. Um, and that can actually be a benefit when you go to harvesting. So a couple ways to harvest a worm bin. You can use what we call the dump approach where you take a tarp or newspaper like you see with this little child um, finding the worms in the piles. Um, you can make multiple piles like this so that the worms will dive down to the bottom of that and then you harvest the compost off the top until you get to the worm layer and you put the worms back into your freshly bedded compost bin. <coughs> this precludes that you're going to dump the whole thing at once. You're going to get everything out of there so that you can freshly bed it, put fresh food in, and add your worms back. You need um, a shovel for this and or those trowels or hand cloth, that kind of thing. Um, it's very simple to do and it takes about a day, maybe a half a day. You can also do what we call a half and half approach, which works better with really large bins or if you don't have a lot of time to be putting the compost out to keep coming back and, you know, scraping compost off the top and letting the worms get away from the light again. You do what we call this half and half approach by pushing the compost. And remember when this is composting, it's reducing in volume. So you've filled this thing up with a lot of carbon material, but the worms have eaten a lot of it and they've reduced it to this rich compost you see in this bottom picture. You move that all aside to one side. You freshly bed the other side, start feeding that over there, feeding the worms on the other side. They will move over into the freshly bedded area. And in about a month, you can safely harvest most of the compost on the other side. Sometimes you'll still find worms in them. Just toss it back into the, the bin. It could take three to nine months to process a worm bin, um, depending on the size of the bin, um, to get compost that's to a finished stage. And this varies depending on temperature and, and how much you feed it, how many worms are in there, um, and the bin size, of course. You don't have to screen your compost. It just makes it look good. So sifting it only makes it mo look more like a commercial product. It's fine to use unsifted because you're basically wanting to dig it in. Where you want to sift it is if you want to use it as a top layer, as a, as a mulch layer in a garden, and you want it to look um, like fresh earth, and look clean and, and even, and then you can have a sifter. We also have um, a plan for sifters too, if you're interested in that. The bin plans that we gave you links for um, live on the Tilth Alliance website, and there's this plan for a sifter, a homemade sifter there as well. Basically, you just set it over a wheelbarrow and you toss the compost on top, and anything that's too big, and what we're seeing in this sifter really is yard waste compost, but anything that's still big, you would put back into the bin for the worms, or if, you have a, if you're doing this with yard waste, you'd throw it back into the bins to start over. So for curbside composting, um, we want to encourage you to use that for your meat and cheese and oily, oily foods, and um, you can use it for your yard waste if you're not yard waste composting. Especially use it for things like diseased plants or weeds that have seed heads on them so that you're not spreading them around. Um, and you don't want to put yard waste or diseased plants or seeded weeds or invasive plants into any kind of food waste system. It's not an appropriate place for them. If you were to put something like bindweed morning glory into a food waste digester, it would just probably start growing like crazy, even in the dark. Um, so that's not the appropriate place for it. Uh, this is also a place that if you have more food waste, then you can process at home in the chosen um, food waste system that you want to use. Go ahead and put it in your curbside composting. Make sure that it, it's getting picked up and taken to commercial compost facilities uh, because they have the the methods to be able to compost at higher temperatures and they're mixing all of this with yard waste as well and all of it gets composted very easily there. Um, so think of your curbside composting as an assist to any kind of home composting that you're doing. And then how do you collect your kitchen scraps? So people do this in lots of ways and I saw there were some comments already about ways people are already doing this which we're talking about here as well. So some of them that were mentioned, including putting scraps in the freezer, which I showed you a picture of, and then taking them out. 
Um, some, um, some people do food scraps, um, peelings, things like that in the freezer and then use them to make soup stocks. So that's kind of taking one step back and even preventing food waste, even from going to compost. And so there's some great methods to do that as well, um, to prevent food scraps from going in the garbage by actually using as much as you can. Um, apple um, peelings, um, carrot peelings, um, potato peelings, even any of those things you can use to make a vegetable stock. And that'll make a great soup stock for you. Um, somebody else mentioned, I think in the question and answer in the chat, that they use a paper bag <clears throat> to put in the compost. And um, I do that a lot. So I might be cooking a lot. Maybe I'm making a bigger meal on the weekend than I normally do. I just use a paper bag, put everything in it and take it out. Um, so I don't store it, um, but I do have a kitchen counter store and I use one that I bought at a, probably Bed Bath & Beyond that was meant to store plastic cereal, or uh, it's a plastic container, meant to store cereal. So it's not uh, used usually as a kitchen composter, but it works really well for me. It's got a lid that snaps on and it's got a little flip lid that I can open and just stuff things in and then close it again. So it stays pretty tightly closed and I don't have a lot of fruit fly issues with that. I line it with a um, compostable bag, but you want to be sure that you get that out of there fairly quickly because those are made to, uh, to decompose and they will begin decomposing after a few days, especially with having acidic, um, maybe orange rinds or um, any kind of wet vegetable sitting in there. <coughs> so be aware that you need to um, process those pretty quickly. Um, you can do things like use a milk carton and a lot of people use those to put into their freezer. Um, and it used to be milk cartons when they were waxed containers could be dumped directly into like a curbside compost system, but they are usually plastic lined these days. So we don't encourage you to use them in that way, but you could reuse them for a while and then clean them out and recycle them if they're still clean. Um, otherwise they would go into the garbage. Um, but there's a lot of commercially available products. There's some that are made to look very elegant, like the little um, galvanized um, or I think maybe stainless steel um, garbage cans that sit on the counter or the one you see in this picture. Uh, lots of different variations. Um, they all work, um, but people have their favorite methods. So use what works well for you, what's going to be easy for you to use. The nice thing about a bucket like this is you don't need a liner. You just put it full of food. You dump the food into your um, compost bin. If, you, if you're feeding the worms, you just feed the worms and then you bring it back in and rinse it out. It's very simple. <clears throat> so these are some of the ways that you can use mulch uh, or compost. So you can use it as a mulch. Um, like I mentioned, some people like that fine look of compost that's very finished and screened. Uh, that goes over the layer, a top layer of the soil. It makes it look pretty, but it also has some functionality. It can help to keep weeds down. It provides some nutrients. Um, but it also helps to moderate soil temperatures. So any kind of mulch on the soil will actually keep the soil either warmer or cold or cooler, depending on the season. So in the wintertime, it can help moderate it so not get so cold. Summertime, it can help keep it cooler for your plants. You can use two to four inches in beds and areas with non-woody plants. Um, this is just a, a great way to actually get it back into the soil without having to dig it in. Um, the soil organisms, the same ones that help make that compost, will still keep coming to keep working on it because there's still material there. And they will pull it into the soil for you and do that work for you. Um, you can dig it in as a soil amendment. And again, same thing, it's going to kickstart soil life because, because it's providing food for organisms in the soil. Um, it's going to aid the soil's ability to actually hold water and um, also to drain water. So compost does both things. And very sandy soil will help to keep water in place. And in clay soil and other kinds of soil help break it up and help you um, to drain water better. Um, and it can provide some nutrients to the soil. Any time is a good time to dig compost into your soil other than when the soil is frozen. But any other time of year is okay to be adding compost. 
Um, when you dig compost into the soil, it can actually allow your plant roots to grow more easily. It's going to improve soil texture. Like I said, it can break up clay soil. You don't want to think of it as a substitute for fertilizer. It adds some nutrients, but always you want to know, um, and usually through soil testing, you can tell what you need in your soil, um, but you may need to do some supplemental fertilizing still. Um, and it holds no moisture and nutrients close to plant roots. So um, it, it becomes a, a, a habitat again for your roots to grow in um, by digging it into the soil. So these are some of the resources that we have um, recommended. Of course, you can call the hotline and ask questions. Um, we have all the bin plans. Uh, we can help you with troubleshooting, finding worms, um, talk about what kind of system might work for you, that kind of thing. Um, but Worms Eat My Garbage is a really wonderful book that talks about everything you need to know about how to set up and maintain worm composting systems. Um, the woman who wrote this um, is, is not alive any longer. It's a legacy book. She um, just did a wonderful service to us by um, putting this book out into the world. Um, but you can learn a lot um, by getting that book. Tilth usually has that for sale, but you should be able to find that in online or at other stores um, as well. Um, so I would recommend that. The library I know has copies of it too. And then of course, Cameron can help you talk about specific um, issues in Shoreline with the composting um, program that um, the city has uh, that he knows more about than I do. Um, and I noticed a lot of people in apartments and condos were talking about not having service at their buildings. And so, you know, thinking about that's something the hotline can also talk to you about is thinking about what could you do there? Of course, you need permission to do certain things, but what kind of things could the residents do to, to really, you know, kickstart getting more food, uh, food waste composted in multifamily settings? Um, because it's important and um, Cameron showed you the statistics on that. It's true, you know, 40% of uh, food goes wasted. Um, so if we can prevent that waste in the first place by using more food than we do and not, not wasting it. And then when we do have food that's wasted to actually use it for compost so that we make something useful back out of it is a good thing. So that's what I got. I know you guys probably have questions that we can go over. I'll turn it back over to Cameron for a moment. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Laura. We have some great questions. Uh, I am curious just to start. What do slug eggs look like? Um, we should look I'm at. Going to do a quick Google search. Yes, we should do a picture. Um, it's the best way to show. Let and while we're it. while we're pulling that up, for there were a couple of people who mentioned um, either having rodent issues or um, kind of interested in deterring rodents. Yeah. So Can you rodent, type, rodents. Type in the chat what kind of bin you use and what yes, um, what system you. you're using and what materials you're putting in it. Because that, that makes a difference. Um, usually, it's it's just a matter of changing your methods because. Again, not ha having food waste in an open system is a recipe for adding rats to your garden. Um, if you have a wood worm bin, you want to put hardware cloth around it. If you're doing a food digester, you want to put hardware cloth around the basket. If you're using the homemade one, you don't need to worry. It's a galvanized can. They can't get in there. Um, food digesters, too. One of the things to think about is that um, you... Um, sometimes you're placing them where critters can get from a tree and jump onto it. And since they have a plastic lid, you may um, get them uh, chewing into it. So try to prevent any access onto the top of the bin. Gotcha. All right. Can you guys still see all this? I think you have to reshare. Okay. Let me find. So we're going to share this article that has a great picture. There are latent clusters like this. Um, they're usually kind of translucent. Sometimes they take a little bit of color 
onto I'm, them. I'm not seeing the photo. I'm just seeing the. The coming up yet? Not yet. Okay, let me try again. <laughs> um. It's okay, we can take a. Oh, there we go. There's a. There you go. Yep. Okay, interesting. Almost like a little. Uh, looks like a pomegranate seed or something. Yeah, these guys want to make me join this and I don't want to. Okay. <laughs> so you can see what these look like here. Gotcha. So um, those but are you can, slug eggs. Yes. So they're usually clustered like this. They're slimy, just like the slug is. Um, they change color as they get a little more mature. Um, they could be sort of brownish in color as well. Gotcha. And typically you'll see slugs in the bin too, but just look for these and just remove them. Gotcha. You can look at other pictures and that will help you to get familiar. There are often, uh, there are other insect eggs, you know, in the world and you want to make sure you're taking the right thing out of there. Gotcha. But in terms of problem pests, that would be one of the key ones. It is one that you're going to find. You can't really control it. Um, they're not, it's not the end of the world. Um, they're in your garden anyway, or they wouldn't right. be in your warm bed. So they're already around. Cool. Uh, a couple questions on green cones. Uh, one, how, how big are they? Oh gosh, I used to have the dimensions of those. They're not, they're about three feet when they're in the ground and maybe about um, 24 inches in diameter maybe. Okay. Yeah, not, they're not huge. No. Uh, yeah. And then how good are those at preventing rats? I forget if you mentioned this. Um, so putting, putting the hardware cloth on the black plastic bin that sits in the ground can be helpful in case of, uh, because it's right near the surface of the soil where it connects to the black cone, rats can sometimes get into that portion and, and um, dig in and chew up the plastic. Um, doesn't happen very often, but it's worth doing it just to prevent it. Uh, and then um, the wood uh, warm bin again you can put around the outside but hardware cloth will help because um, they don't like to gnaw into that it's pretty thick metal it's not they can gnaw into many things wood and plastic included gotcha thanks and also also the other thing Cameron I mentioned was keeping it away from a place they can jump on top of the lid <laughs> some adventurous rats yeah it kind of depends on how uh, how desperate the rats in your area are if they have other uh Yes. Ready food sources. You'll notice in those pictures, all those all those green cones are sitting in open areas where there isn't something right. above them. Great. For a reason. Great. And it, I did a bit of poking around and it looks like there are some other similar models to the green cones that are out mm -hmm. there at Home Depot and stuff that are a, a thick plastic that are yep. designed, the same design. It just, yep. you put the food waste in, it goes into the ground. Um, great. So the next one, uh, so I'm assuming this is about burying, but how how deep should you bury food scraps? Um, you know, ideally you want to get them at least 12 inches down and put you know put that much soil over the top so that they're out of the root zone of most plants above them um, as you plant. Um, that way you can plant more directly into the soil. If you plant them more shallowly, you need to let it um, decompose for a while before you plant into it, and also. The more shallow it is, the more likely it is to like a raccoon to dig it up. Right. Yeah, the other the other kind of rats we have around here. Um, yes. I okay. So a couple questions about chickens. I also have chickens. Is there a good way to add their dirty bedding to a food waste composting system? Not really. They do best in their own kind of composting system. You could create. Um, you could create a green cone kind of system where you where you decompose it by itself, um, just the bedding that's dirty because what what you have there is a mix of nitrogen and carbon with the um, with the chicken waste and the um, straw or what sawdust or whatever it is you have for bedding. Um, if you put it in with food waste, um, I think that's just going to complicate the process. It's not going to uh, decompose as quickly and or you may get a more anaerobic system um, eventually with that because you're adding you're adding a whole lot of nitrogen when you add chicken manure to something. Gotcha and and that kind of points I forget if you had the slide on this but the the sort of basic rule to thumb ratio of 
carbon, nitrogen, greens, and browns. Yeah, which is so more for yard waste. It's more per yard waste. We say 50 50 in, in, by volume because the amount of grass clippings versus the amount of leaves it takes to mix together to give you the good carbon nitrogen ratio is about 50% in volume for both. Um, but in a food waste system, you're really just doing, um, especially in a food digester, that's why it's a more anaerobic and more mucky system. It's high nitrogen because it's, it's mostly just food waste. In a warm bin, you have the bedding and you have the food and you have more of that classic composting system. Gotcha. Okay, a couple of ones bumped to the top here. So uh, would dug fir and cedar needles be too acidic to add to the worm bin as part of the bedding? They would be, yes. And, and scratchy. Mm. Um, the materials that are added to worm bins are usually not too caustic. Um, in the sense of, you know, worms moving through it. It's not the kind of leaf litter that they would like. They like deciduous leaves. Gotcha. And we have another one. What is something that is commonly composted that should not be added into your uh, compost? I'm assuming the home, uh, backyard or worm bin. Um, and what is something that a lot of people commonly don't think they can compost, but actually can? Oh, those are, those are interesting questions. Um, if we're talking about food waste systems, um, in a personal home system, a lot of times people have been taught not to use orange peels um, because they think it gets too acidic. The folks out at Monroe Penitentiary have a very sophisticated um, worm composting system that they built. They actually did this really amazing project where they used old mattress frames and um, built all these huge bins and they use, they bring the food in from, um, you know, feeding everybody and waste from the gardens that they manage, farms that they manage on site. And they decompose it in this warehouse area with all these huge worm bins. And um, they have proven that citrus has no effect whatsoever. They decompose it just fine. Um, so that would be the one thing I would say people have been taught not to put in, but it's okay to put in. Um, mm. As far as what not to put in, I mean, or what to put in that they don't know. Um, I don't know, coffee grounds maybe. Sometimes people are surprised by that. Coffee grounds are really high in nitrogen. Worms love them. They're great for any kind of composting system. They typically, coffee grounds don't matter as much in a, in a yard waste system either. Um, animals don't seem to be too attracted to them. It's the eggshell, the protein products uh, that seem to be more of an issue. Awesome, thanks. Okay, how, um, how do you use compost when you are growing veggies in large pots? Is there a good ratio, I'm assuming, for mixing in the soil? Um, you can use it in a couple ways when you're growing veggies in large pots, when you're preparing your pots in the spring. Um, if you're starting with a new pot, just use the fresh potting soil and call it good because it's already got everything you need. If you're using it second, third, fourth, fifth years, dump it out, add some compost to it. That's gonna refresh your soil. It's gonna add microorganisms back to the soil um, and then, um, some more nutrient for your plant. So then you just repot with fresh soil that's had compost added to it. You can also add compost during the growing season as a little bit of a mulch around your plants, especially vegetable plants, just on top in the pot. You don't need to put very much. You don't even need to make it an inch deep. You just do it periodically. And that, that helps to keep the soil temperature more moderated and helps to sort of add a little bit of nutrient and it helps to add microorganisms back into the pot. Awesome, thanks. Okay, we have a compost bin that we use, but do have some issues with fruit flies. Can you use enzymes to help with this? Um, I would probably want a little more information about your bin. Is it an outdoor bin, indoor bin? Um, but typically, um, when, you have com when you have fruit fly issues, you add more bedding to the top of whatever's in there because fruit flies will lay their eggs in the material that you know, they like. So whatever kind of rotting fruit. Um, sometimes you'll see them in potting soil in your house plants. Uh, you'll get 
um, different kind of fungus gnats and things like that. Same kind of thing. They like moisture. Um, so you're trying to disrupt the area where they lay eggs by smothering that and putting something in they can't get to as easily. So fresh bedding is usually the best answer for that. Even awesome. in a kitchen compost bin, even if you have it and you want it to sit there for two days, just get some paper shredded up and put it in the top of there and that will help to prevent them from coming up or put it in your freezer, save some mm -hmm. freezer space. Right. Cool. Uh, Judy, great question about, um, and there were a couple of folks who brought this up. If you live in an apartment or condo that doesn't have uh, compost service, what can you do? Um, you know, that's a great, that's a big problem, you know, something that we'd love to solve. So I had a, I would love to hear from you guys. If you have any ideas, please reach out to me via email. Um, yeah, I guess I'm curious if you have worked with your property managers or ask them about adding it, you know, what what is your site like? Would there be room to do something on, on site there? Um, yeah, I would love to see more apartment properties provide that for residents. Um, or if you have other ideas, please, please let me know. That's, that's the only answer I have to that at this point is uh, let's work on it together. Some of the folks in Seattle, even before, especially before there was food waste composting became mandatory and before everybody had to do it, including multifamily housing now. Um, so like in an area down around the Cascade neighborhood um, where Cascade Pea Patch is, uh, they made an arrangement with people that lived around it, made an arrangement with the Pea Patch to be able to bring food scraps to the community garden. So right. you never know, there might be a community garden that could do that or how maybe a project um, that could be built into community gardens to have a whole bunch of worm bins that people could access. It's not going to solve the big right. problem, but it might do some pocket right. areas. Yeah, ultimately, that's sort of a yeah a policy question for the city is, yeah. you know, it, is that something that we want to make people do? But then it, it can also be challenging at, at larger properties to make sure people are, uh, you know, composting correctly. So, but I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, please reach out via email. Oops, let's keep going. We got some more great questions here. Um, and so, yeah, we got somebody asking, is it a good idea to bury food waste directly into the garden? It sounds like that is one of the methods, um, but maybe just say a little bit more about kind of finding a, a good spot for- Yeah, so you have to have a place you can dig deep enough to get it under there well enough. And, and so that, so my yard would not qualify. Um, I have, I live in Seattle in the Delridge area. Um, it's very wet until it's still wet out there. I can't mow my lawn yet. I have a little tiny lawn and I can't mow it. Um, and I couldn't dig deep enough to do anything like that because I have a lot of clay soil and hard soil. So um, I don't do that. But if you have good loose soil, especially if you have an area with sandy soil, it's a great way to improve your sandy soil. So dig deep, put the food waste in, um, bury it. Um, the trick is that often, if we're gardeners, we don't have a lot of open area. So because unless we have vegetable beds that we want to prep. So maybe there's a period of time you can bury your food scraps, but maybe the rest of the summer you can't because maybe you can do it all winter in your raised beds. You know, that would be the way to do it. And then in the summer you do something else um, because we have plants everywhere. So the trick is having an open enough area to be able to do it often enough and move it around. Um, I know that in Japan, the Bokashi method of composting is very common and used by the, the urban uh, compost goes out to the farms and then they bury it in the, in the ground, in the farmland. Great. Awesome, thanks. Uh, a question about possums. Has anyone, well, you know, just noting that they're beneficial members of our community as well, um, are they, ha have you had problems with, with them getting into compost? They can, yes, they they know where to find food. I personally have had more problems with them eating my strawberries than <laughs> anything. Squirrels and possums eat my strawberries. Yeah, we have squirrels and raccoons at my, mm -hmm. my house. Um, how long do tumbling systems typically take to create a batch of compost? It uh, depends on what your mix is, um, but it could be about a month maybe. Um, which is pretty fast considering, you know, yard waste systems take longer than that usually. Um, 
But yeah, if you put in food waste and some good carbon material, you should be able to get something out of that, especially if you're you know, pretty religious about turning it, uh, keeping it moving, keeping it hot. Great. Um, just looking through here, got a couple. Okay, question about diseased plant material. Can we bury that in compost or in our gardens without promoting the disease further? Uh, depends this, this on- This one was already yeah, answered, but- Yeah, it depends partially on the disease. So something like tomato blight, which is a soil-borne disease that splashes up on the plants and infects them, you would want to put that in a curbside bin, get rid of it. If it's something like powdery mildew that's on your squash leaf or your zucchini leaf, um, you, and it's really bad and you want to trim some off, you can cut that up and put it into the compost. You could put, probably put that in the food waste or the, a worm bin, the worms would eat it. Powdery mildew isn't going to spread in the same way that something like a soil borne disease will. So knowing a little bit about what the disease is can help you. And you can, that's something you can call us about at the hotline. You can ask, you know, we can help you with that. But basically the idea is that these are, um, these are also, organisms that will decompose and something will decompose them and something will eat them when you put them into the earth. So um, they get used up too. It's Great. not the way certain things spread. Gotcha. But yeah, safer to go in the, in the uh, curbside. It thing. is. If you have any questions, just put it in the curbside mm -hmm. bin. And uh, another question about the, uh, the curbside bin uh, was about I thought we couldn't put shredded paper in the compost. Uh, maybe that was recycle bin. So correct, you can't put it in the recycle bin. They don't want it there anymore. And they Cedar Grove, which is the facility down in Seattle and in Everett that takes our compost from the curb, uh, they don't want shredded paper because there's a problem with um, you know just different things getting in shredded paper. So if it's like a window envelope or um, you know some things have credit cards that people shred. Uh, so there's a lot of plastic and then it also, it doesn't go through, um, well, for the recycling, it doesn't go through the recycle facility, but then, yeah, there's just a lot of contamination in it for the composting. So, but it sounds like if you're the one making it and you know it's clean, doesn't have plastic, sounds like that can be a good bedding material for, for worms. Yeah, it's a fine bedding material for worms. It's something you can use to put in the top of the bin in your kitchen if you've got fruit fly issues. Um, yeah, but you, you know, you do want to make sure of what you're shredding. You don't want all that plastic in there either in your own systems. People complain about plastic and compost that they buy commercially, but it's there because we put it there. Mm -hmm. So, yep. And it's really, cause the first thing that happens in the compost facility, I don't know if you guys have ever been to one or done a tour, but first thing that happens is everything gets shredded. So as soon as you have one little piece of plastic, all of a sudden it's become thousands yeah. of pieces of plastic. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, if you're doing it at home, it sounds like you, you can use that material in your backyard, no problem. Um, looking for more. So a little bit, can you remind me the name of the worms, uh, the type of worm that is used for composting and that is different than normal earthworms? And I'm also curious, can that just naturally occur? Like if you They're hypothetically not had, a, had a bin? They're in not backyard. native here. They are around. Um, they are called Icenia, and there's different species. That's why it just says Icenia species in the name, because there's a couple different kinds. Um, typically, what you buy are, are those. Um, sometimes other kinds of worms are sold, like for fishing, uh, but you can mm -hmm. use a red worm to fish with as well. Um, they are red wigglers or red worms is what their common name is. But Icenia is their Latin name. and answered shredded newspaper that would be okay to use as well yeah it's used a lot in compost bins it's one of the most common things uh, i'm getting less so now that we don't have as many newspapers right. anymore right uh, but it used to be like the number one thing everybody would use is shredded newspaper right um okay and another chicken manure question um a little bit more into the yard waste section but what's the best mix of yard waste material if you're trying to compost chicken manure um, usually it's enough if you have the bedding and the comp and the chicken manure together. If you don't have enough bedding, then you just need some kind of carbon material, whatever you can get easily. Maybe you have a 
huge maple tree in the fall, like a big leaf maple, save those leaves, shred them up and bag them, and then use that to feed into the chicken manure for your compost. Because you don't need much of anything else. You just need carbon to go with that high nitrogen chicken manure. Gotcha. Um, can tissues be put in the into a compost bin? Uh, I'll answer that for the curbside bin. <laughs> Um, they don't want anything that has a, you know, human bodily fluids on it. Um, so if you blow your, you know, you're sick and you blow your nose on a Kleenex or tissue, um, that would need to go in the garbage. Um, and Laura, I'll let you take that for the backyard. Well, I think people will make, can make their own judgment on that. If they're making compost for themselves, it's probably not, you know, if you, if you, you know, I'm uh, most disease organisms aren't going to live for too long in a system like that. But I mean, just, just to be safe, it's not enough material to worry about. I would just put it in the garbage because then you don't have to worry about it at all. Right. Thanks for that. And going down here, down our list. Uh, how about, do you know if there is a less costly alternative to purchased Bokashi enzymes? So just trying to save on the cost in that system. You would have to sort of investigate the different things that they add. Basically, they're putting in different microorganisms that will that just start eating away at stuff um, because it's in a it's just in a bin by itself. Um, some of that will grow naturally by itself. You could try doing it without the enzymes. The enzymes just speed it up. You know, it has enzymes and also different microorganisms, but you know, and they're usually proprietary blends, whoever sells that stuff to you. Um, right. You can put it in a, a bucket and put a layer of carbon on top and just let it decompose and bury it if you want to do that um, without, without the added material. Gotcha. Thanks. Uh, another question on can we compost bones? Uh, I'll take that for the curbside. Yes, you can put, um, you know, food, bones uh, in, in your curbside cart, no problem. Uh, you don't want to put bones in home composting systems. They take too long to break down. They attract too many critters. Um, the worms aren't going to do a whole lot with them. I think they might if they were smaller, mm -hmm. crushed up. Typically, they don't recommend, you know, mixing animal food and vegetable food into a worm bin. Some worm bins are set up to handle pet manures, um, and they don't, they don't recommend doing like food waste and pet manure together. So I think it would be the same thing with meat scraps or meat bones. Right. Um, but with bone um, and meat scraps, uh, and the other thing they're doing out at Monroe is they have a soldier fly um, room where they, they take a lot of the meat scraps and bones and put them in in the soldier fly larva, eat them. Mm. Um, so sometimes you'll see so soldier fly larva in a, a worm bin they will come in. And that sometimes is because of what people are putting in there. Great, thanks. A uh, couple questions on tea bags and staples. This is a great question. So again, curbside, Recology, uh, Cedar Grove, they actually have stopped. They don't want tea bags in the compost because of both this issue and a lot of brands of tea bags now will have, will actually be plastic sachets. Um, so they have just said, it's too confusing. People are putting all kinds of tea bags in there. And yes, the staple uh, would be a contaminant in the curbside compost. And if it's a plastic sachet, then that would also be a contaminant. So they have just sort of drawn a line and said no tea bags. Um, but how about Laura for, um, you know, backyard, obviously the metal, metal's not gonna compost. Um, what, what's your take on tea? Is it tea leaves, would that be okay for worms? Tea, tea leaves are fine. Just like, I mean, they're made out, you know, it's just tea, tea comes from the camellia plant. It's just a little leaf. Right. It's fine. Um, coffee grounds are fine. Uh, right. The tea bags with the metal that are paper that are going to decompose will decompose. Um, it'll take time. They take longer to break down because all of that has to come apart before everything can be gotten to. I don't think the little staples are a huge enough issue in your home compost to worry right, about, right. to be honest. Um, yeah. You put them into the garden and they're gonna eventually just decay over time. It takes a long time. They rust out, but um, yeah, you don't want those plastic 
you want to be sure of what you're looking at with tea bags because they do come in all these different forms. And this is another subject where the, you know, reducing waste, so maybe buying bulk tea would also help yeah. you, you know, then you can compost everything that's, you know, left. I use both, um, and, but I prefer using bulk tea. Um, and I just have my little tea caddy thing, my little tea thing, whatever you call those things. And then I dump that in the compost bin. Great. Okay, so just a, a couple more curbside questions. Um, I, it looks like we've got to most of the questions about uh, backyard composting, um, but I can just take these really quick. Um, and then there is a question about composting pet waste. So, um, so curbside, yeah, they do not, you don't want pet waste or kit, you know, kitty litter, dog poop, they don't want it in the curbside bin. Please do not put it in there, bag it and put it in, in the garbage. Um, the compost facilities are, you know, there's too many pathogens in, in pet waste, especially cat and animal feces, or cat and dog feces, um, and the compost facilities were not designed to handle that kind of waste. Um, so please put those in the garbage. Um, but yeah, just curious, Laura, if you know very much, I, I did see some information about certain kinds, I, maybe the green cone that was, some systems were able to handle pet waste. Um, there is a type of a green cone, sort of it's the same kind of principle. Uh, there's a company called Doggy Dooley that sells this, but other people do too. Mm -hmm. uh, again, they put, it's just a thing that's buried in the ground, sticks up out of the ground. You have to have a yard that drains well because it's going right. to create a lot of liquid. And then that needs to be absorbed into the ground around it. Um, so it's this exact same principle, but it's like Bokashi. They have a special enzyme that you mm -hmm. toss in the, in the thing. Um, with the worm bin, um, worms will get used to eating it, and that will be their food. Um, and with the bedding, um, and you, but you, you know, it works better if you have a small pet rather than a big pet, um, and you have to have the right kind of soil if you're doing the in-ground systems with that. Gotcha. Yeah, and just personally, my two cents. You know, shoreline is a pretty urban environment, and we have a lot of pets. And all of the streams, uh, water bodies in, in shoreline have struggle with, with high bacteria levels. So pet waste is a huge issue. Properly disposing of it is a huge issue. So yeah, I personally wouldn't recommend, um, you know, composting that at home just because of, you know, our, our environment here in shoreline. Um, yeah, if you're near bodies of water, it's not a good idea because it goes into the ground and into the groundwater. That's okay. where it goes. Um, human manure composting, I, that's something I don't know very much about. That would be a whole other topic. Well, there are, <laughs> there are composting toilets around. Um, I know the bullet building, their mm -hmm. system is all composting toilet. Um, and there is a outdoor composting toilet at the Carter Farm Pea Patch where I used to garden. Uh, that was mm -hmm. the first one built in the city. Um, I haven't been there in about three years and I haven't asked them. But when I left there, they still hadn't had to have it removed. Now, the part of the rule was we couldn't use the compost. It had to be removed by a waste company. Right. But they hadn't, still hadn't had to have any of the, uh, the manure waste removed. Um, right. But it's built to you know, absorb the liquid waste um, into right. the ground and all that. Yeah, I've used a, a few different composting toilets and um, and actually this is a fun fact though so our wastewater system at, at King County is awesome and the um, you know it's sent our waste is sent to the wastewater treatment plant you know there's organisms that break down remove the bacteria remove the nutrients the the water once it goes through then exits the facility but there is some solids that are left and those are they have a, a program to use those those are called biosolids where they I believe they take them to farms out in eastern Washington. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really cool. That's it's like composting on a you know huge scale with all of our combined waste. So so that is a, a pretty cool thing that happens. So we are kind of composting our waste already um, and, and making good use of some of the nutrients there. Um, so I I think I'm going to wrap up there. There are a couple we didn't get to, but thank thank you everybody for the great questions. I just want to share my screen again. I have a little bit of information um, about the compost pails. So let's see. Um, are you seeing my screen there, Laura? Yes. Okay. 
So if you're a shoreline resident that registered and you check the box to request the compost pail, I, I'll have those for you starting tomorrow at noon. Um, I'll have those ready for pickup. So you can pick them up from Shoreline City Hall. I have the address down there on the slide. And you'll also get this information in the follow-up email for those of you who, who registered for the, the compost pail. Again, they are just for Shoreline residents. So sorry for those of you who are joining from other, other communities. Um, but here's a picture of, of the city hall. So what you'll do, I'll have them available for the whole this whole month until April 30th. You can come anytime during our business hours um, and actually a little bit smaller window. So 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Recognize that's kind of hard for a lot of people, but um, that's, that's what we're able to do. So uh, you, what you'll do is you'll pull off, this is the view of the front door. So it's Midvale Avenue, pull into the front parking spot there instead of going all the way around to the back of the, uh, the garage behind the building. You can just pull in front, walk up to those front steps and uh, wait at the doors or knock on the doors and staff will come out. Just give them your name, tell them what you're there to pick up. And I, I'll have the list of names in your compost pit pail there ready. Um, so you can come any anytime during the month of April uh, to grab that. And yep, there's little arrows. These are what the pails look like. They're really great. Um, they have a, like a little interior plastic liner. So you don't actually need to use the um, the plastic bag liners, you can just hand wash that. It's great, or, or you can use a liner if you like, but they look pretty nice. They're great little units. Um, and then just a reminder, the Earth Day photo challenge. So send me a photo. We wanna see how you guys compost. Um, we're building a big photo wall of everybody's uh, photos uh, for how we celebrate Earth Day every day um, on this website. So send me a photo. You can find more information at shorelinewa.gov slash Earth Day. And if you submit by Monday, you'll, you'll get a chance to enter the raffle. And uh, next week, we have a, a fun class. Um, I'm actually teaching this one. It's on safer cleaning for a healthy home. So we'll cover how to choose safer cleaning products and how to actually make some of your own safer cleaners at home using some common ingredients. So it's a, it's a fun class. And we do also have a giveaway for that one for Shoreline residents. It's a cleaning kit that includes a nice glass spray bottle and um, some other supplies to do all of the, the recipes that we'll talk about. Um, so it'll be fun, pretty interactive class. Um, so join us next week for that same time, Wednesday the 14th at 7 p.m. Uh, you can register at that same Earth Day, shorelinewall.gov slash Earth Day website. Um, and that is all I have. So thanks so much, Laura, and thanks everybody for spending your Wednesday evening with us. You guys have some wonderful um, kits that you're giving people. And that um, that kitchen counter thing is a deluxe model, I must say. It's a nice one. We figured yeah. we want something that people will use that will last a long time. And um, if, especially if, if you're gonna have it sitting out on your counter. I mean, I personally use just like a metal metal bit, uh, you know, mixing bowl for mine, but uh, it's I know my wife would like a nicer one, so. <laughs> Um, so thank you, everybody. And yes, you'll get you'll get the instructions. We'll send out all the links. We'll send out a link to the recording. We'll have Laura's info. You'll, you have my info already. Um, so I'll send that out tomorrow sometime in the morning. Uh, so look out for that. Um, please send us your photos for the Earth Day Challenge. And thank you so much for joining us. Have a great night. Great. Thank you, Cameron. Yep. Thanks, Laura. We'll see you again soon.